702 or so. And uh, we call this regular meeting to order. Allison? Here. 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 Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There's a full house tonight, isn't it? Okay, uh, next on the agenda is the recognition of public comments. Um, when so directed, it can stand at the podium. Uh, give your name and begin your statements, and you'll have about five minutes to do that. Uh, first speaker is Jennifer McKillop. <clears throat> My name is Jennifer McKillop, and I have a daughter who is in kindergarten at Sia Floyd. Um, I really hate public speaking, so bear with me as I stick to my notes. I was shocked to find out there's a possibility of extending the elementary school day even further. I'm here to address why I disagree with extending that so much and why I don't believe it will be beneficial, especially for the younger kids. I also strongly believe it's unfair to our district's elementary school teachers. I'm going to try to address both of these separately as well as I can. A lot of these decisions seem based upon data and metrics, so I decided to provide some simple numbers myself. 45 minutes times 174 school days equals 7,830 minutes, or 130 and a half hours uh, school year. That's 130 and a half hours less that parents will get to see their children's already constantly changing faces, 130 and a half hours less that kids will get to play at home and be kids when childhood is already so fleeting, and 130 hours less for teachers to have time to plan lessons, grade, answer parent emails, or be with their own families. I don't think getting to school earlier and adding 45 minutes to a young child's day is beneficial. The statement of having our district's awesome students spending more time with our district's awesome teachers sounds great, of course, but it's a very much sim oversimplification of a multi-layered issue involving both our children and our teachers, neither of whom were asked their opinion on this, or the parents. Um, one issue I'd really like to point to would be their mental health. Uh, very few of us in this room maybe none, know what it's like to be a young child or a teacher the last few years during this pandemic. Um, they have to be totally burnt out. Is the district offering more mental health resources or are we just adding more to their workload? My daughter comes home exhausted from school already as it is. She is five years old. When I was five, I went to half day kindergarten. Um, when my cousin was five, she had full day kindergarten, but she had nap times in addition to recess. My child is five and has a full day, no nap time, but she has taken standardized tests, owns dozens of masks, and has participated in several active shooter drills. And now we want them to stay 45 minutes more. I don't think even more mental load is what these kids need. And for what it's worth, I can't understand starting the day 15 minutes earlier in order to help compensate for the time the teachers are serving the breakfast. But 45 minutes more of classroom time, I don't think will improve the grades of our students or the morale of our teachers. However, if you do insist on the addition of 45 minutes, then at least I would suggest looking toward the model ROVA has with their elementary schools, who go the length of time you're suggesting, but who take two 30-minute recesses daily. There are many research articles, including two by Stanford and the CDC on the benefits of recess, that I'd be happy to email to anyone interested. But a few of the points I'd really like to highlight about the benefits of recess are the social and emotional benefits, which are improved ability to negotiate and share, better social interactions, increased school connectedness, and improved school climate. I think all of these are huge social factors that I can only been, imagine have been missing or lacking for most of our students the past few years. Not to mention the direct academic improvements from recess, including better behavior in classrooms, improved memory and attention, and better attendance. That's the number of 130 and a half hours. I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume the teachers will not be compensated extra for 130 and a half hours of their lives. 
This is a profession that has now to be one of the few where so much labor is uh, constantly expected to go unpaid. These last few years, our teachers have had to go with the rapidly changing methods in which they were even able to teach. They turned their homes into virtual quasi-classrooms. They found ways to try and keep children engaged, even through a computer screen and now back in person. They've been tasked with uh, not only the challenge of teaching during a still present pandemic, but we've got a breakfast duty and for a while mask monitoring duties. And now we're demanding even more of their labor unpaid. There has already been a mass exodus of teachers nationwide the last few years. Those that remain are resilient and passionate. They're clearly in this profession out of a love for the children and the shaping of young minds. Why would we want to punish those that remain with even more stress? I'm sure if this passes, we'll be losing even more wonderful teachers. Surely some of our teachers commute here from other areas. An additional 45 minutes can equate to a huge life change, especially to commuters. Many of our teachers have families. Will the district be finding ways to help cover the costs many of these teachers will now have to use for childcare? They wouldn't need to otherwise without a major schedule shift like this. I know the theme here is supposed to be for the children, but what about the children of these teachers? Teaching is already such a thankless and underpaid, underappreciated profession. I ask each member here to really think about whether they can feel good about creating even more stress and hurdles for those in this profession. I personally think the best gift we could give to our children in this district is the gift of teachers who feel appreciated and valued and heard by their district and their school board. I don't think asking them for even more after they've already given so much is a way to go about retaining our best teachers and showing them the appreciation that they deserve. I thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Weston Oxford. Thank you. Walked up there, I thought there were two Weston Oxfords. <laughs> 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 Um, so uh, I, we, have, we have five in the district, four um, in high school right now, and um, the, the focus of my concern is just the, the lateness of the day that you're aiming at. And I understand you guys have multiple problems you're trying to solve creatively, and I get that. I just, you know, our kids having been involved in extracurricular stuff um, so much, and thinking of what that's already done to them. I mean, the number of times my wife and I are spending, you know, helping them with homework, you know, late into the evening. Um, and we're, we're blessed, we've both got good education, we can help our kids through that, but they've been on sports teams where we've watched some of these kids who, who aren't, you know, don't have the academic support that our kids got. And they got, you know, quarantined for COVID this last year, and they missed a number of classes. And then when they were finally out of that, well, they missed a number of classes, they're academically struggling, and guess what, they were ineligible. And, you know, the number of games where they had to leave school early, and just, okay, at this point they would have missed a portion of a block, now, with this schedule, they'd be missing multiple classes. I mean, they're gonna become ineligible. Um, not to mention, you know, if that those things continue to happen, will kids shy more away from extracurricular? Every stat I've ever read that the more they're likely they're involved in extracurricular, the more likely we're able to retain them in school, um, keep them connected. I know that's always a big issue here, you know, retention and getting people to graduate and stay involved and all those type of things. So as I, again, I know there's trade-offs, advantages, disadvantages with any decision you make, but, Man, uh, just from this one angle is a pretty mountain. I know other people are addressing other aspects, but we kind of got a front row seat to, to watch a number of the, that happen with, again, largely the kids that our, our kids were connected with, but um, as a little bit of a heartbreaker as you start to look ahead and go, what that could happen to. I mean, we've primarily seen it in sports and band, but other extracurricular issues, and um, I just I would hate to see us make structural changes that are discouraging those things. So, thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Jenny Robinson. So my name is Jenny Robinson. I'm a GHS math teacher and a parent to three young first students in the district. I'm here more probably as a parent than a teacher tonight, but I am here on both ends. I'm here to speak on behalf of a large group of concerned parents and students and teachers in regards to the new proposed ballot schedules. Um, I have contacted just myself in the past week over 65 people um, in some way, shape, or form, including parents, teachers of, and of all different ranges, um, and a few community members who happen to employ our students in the community. 
Um, I did have a few non-responses, but I had 52 responses stacked out of the 65 people. And um, every single one of those 52 were a pretty strong um, in disagreement of the new schedule for many, many reasons. Uh, this is a very, very big change, um, a huge change to the schedule for the 7 through 12 buildings, at least. And here, when we already have many, many numerous changes happening, we are already changing buildings, we are changing schedules, and for many departments, we are changing full curriculums to allow from the, to the new 7 through 12 schedule. Um, we have discussed many of the pros and cons that have been discussed before or that we did, we were aware of. It seems like the list of pros are some possibilities that definitely could happen. Um, the list of cons are definite consequences that are going to happen. There's no doubt about it. Um, we just would like to know that we would like to see that there would be some more input. Um, every parent that I contacted had no clue about any of this happening. Some teachers did because they had read previous <coughs> information before. Um, I would just like to raise some of the concerns that were the major ones brought up at this. Obviously, the lack of, lack of, lack, loss of class time, sorry, um, not only on the student athlete side, but also just on the teacher side who we're fortunate that our teachers are coaches as well, and they do all that stuff. The loss of class time there and trying to find subs is much more time happening. Um, pushing back just everything in that amount of time, the 350 in start to a day, is going to be just pushing everything back. It just seems like it's just the kids really aren't going to get more sleep. It's just going to be a shifted sleep, possibly. Um, they're going to stay up even later because they're going to get practice even later. They're going to get home even later, up homework later, to bed later. Um, I've talked to some students and parents who are very concerned because their student has a job after school, and this job would be a very hard thing to keep pushing that day back. We have students who bring their work uniforms to school and are able to get to school by three o'clock and take a good four or five hour shift and then still get home, still do homework, and still able to go on with their night. Um, this would possibly be a lot harder to do. Uh, another example is kids who are able to be in multiple activities. So as Mr. Oxley said, and I have a daughter that is this way too, able to be in soccer, volleyball, swim, football, all of those fall sports, and be able to be in marching band, for example. We're very fortunate that our marching band directors are gracious to have evening practices so that these kids can participate in multiple things. Um, they're out at practice at 5.30. My kid hops out of the pool, eats a granola bar, walks across the field, and goes to band from 6 to 9, and then gets home in time to push out as much homework as she can before bed. Um, I worry that with this pushback of this, that's probably not even an option, honestly. If she gets out of practice at 6.30, she's gonna have to make a choice. I, there's no way that band can practice till 10 or 10.30 at night and still work that way. So I worry that those kids are gonna have to make hard decisions and choices. Um, we have many unknowns with the change from the four block to the seven period day. Our high school teachers are worked tremendous amounts of hours to create new curriculums to make this happen and making the most of this, but we just have many unknowns about it. We're really worried about changing too much in one year. We just don't know what workload is gonna be and things like that for the students. Um, I've also heard about a lot of childcare concerns from parents. Um, if this happens to me, my older children are the ones that help with my younger children after school. They pick him up for me, they get him off the bus, whatever until somebody else can get home. I've heard that concern from multiple parents that it's the older siblings that help with the younger siblings and if we have this whole shift of schedule that would no longer be possible. Um, I've heard concerns from younger parents, younger children's parents saying that they don't like the idea of their children having to be in after school care for that much longer of a period of time. Um, the, I know one of the pros of this was possibly that, you know, this could help with tardies and absences and things, and that could happen. Um, that's not something that might not, but it's just a possibility. We're hoping and praying for the best in that. And honestly, as seeing, you know, how tardies and absences happen in the high school, I don't see that pushing an hour back is going to change that. I think if you ask those teachers and even um, why our absences <coughs> and tardies happen, that as well. Um, coaches, club sponsors, 
drama, all of these things that happen after school. Some teachers and coaches and stuff have said we would be forced to possibly move things to the morning, and that kind of defeats the purpose then. If the kids are gonna have to still get at school at seven o'clock to be able to have a practice or have a weightlifting or something, then did, what did we really do with that? Um, I know we don't want to always focus on student athletes. I know that's tended to be a history kind of thing that like we don't want to focus on that necessarily solely, but we crunched some numbers and this is affecting 300 some student athletes in our building that between we uh, went through and added up the fall, not very many winter, but a few winter sports, and spring, especially, lots of spring sports, um, where students have to get out early and it would be affecting a very large amount of students. Um, we would have, with the new schedule, we would have students who would possibly have to get out early even for a home event. Um, we have things that need to start on time because of weather and whatever in the spring and fall and we wouldn't even, we, they have to get out early even on a home game day. And then um, another comment that came up was someone talked about that scheduling of things, which I guess this is kind of a different point because you can still have this with the elementary kids, but this parent was concerned her daughter has an appointment every three weeks in Peoria, standing appointment, the doctor will take nothing less than late than four o'clock. So she said, now I'm pulling my kid out later to try to even get to appointments. So I just want to throw that in case. She was very concerned about that. So, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, uh, next up on the agenda is presentations to the board. Uh, I'm going to adjust this a little bit and start with the recognition, recognition of uh, state medalists. So, Mr. Matthews, go mind. And one minute. Just <laughs> recognize. If I could have Coach Noonan, Coach Leibach, and Coach Sharp come up, um, they're each going to get the opportunity to introduce you to some exceptional athletes that uh, participated at the state level and brought home a medal. So we'll have Coach Noonan go first, and then uh, we'll have Coach Leibach and Coach Sharp finish up. We'll have the athletes come up uh, after that. They'll go around and be able to shake hands, and then we'll meet out in the hallways for a picture. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Jason Nunbaum. Jason is a junior. Come on up, Jason. So the eyes are on you. Uh, Jason is a, a junior for the golf team. He's been a varsity player since he was a freshman. Uh, he, he had an outstanding junior season where he was top three in every every dual triangular and, and quad that we played in. Uh, and then the big matches, he brought home multiple medals. He uh, finished off the, the terrific season with a really outstanding postseason run. That's why we're here. He got uh, second, solo second at the Western Big Six Conference. He got seventh at, at the regional match. He got third at sectionals. And then uh, at the two-day state tournament, he finished up with seventh place. And he had, I think, the second best score of the day on day two. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, he, he was just on fire on day two. It was, it was a lot of fun to watch him play. And then to top it all off, at the end of the year, the coaches all got together and voted Jason the Western Big Six player of the year. So it was an outstanding season. First of all, thanks to the school board and to our uh, administrations for their support of, uh, of wrestling. We are grateful for the opportunities that we have every winter uh, to participate in this sport that we love. Um, I'll just say it's really cool to see young people um, commit to long-term goals and then show the perseverance mm -hmm. to go after them on a daily basis. And when those long-term goals are achieved, like these guys have achieved, um, it's cause for celebration for sure. So thank you for having us. Um, we are missing one of our other wrestling state qualifiers this evening. Jeremiah Morris is a senior. 
Um, he put together one of the great seasons in, in, in Galesburg wrestling history. He had a record of 39 and 6. He was a conference champion. He was a regional champion. And he was a state qualifier to finish out his wrestling career, which is a, an awesome cap. And uh, unfortunately, he works on Monday evenings, but I just like to give. In wrestling, we give one big clap in recognition. So if we could give one big clap for Jeremiah, I'd appreciate it. One, two, three. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about these guys kind of as a duo because they are tangled together uh, in the wrestling room every day after school um, as drill partners. They went to the state tournament in Champaign back in late February, and the state tournament had lots of emotional ups and downs. Um, there were advancements through the winner's bracket, which put us on high. There were losses, which kind of had us reeling and recovering. But we arrived at Saturday morning um, at the State Farm Center in Champaign in what they call the blood round. And in the blood round, the loser is done for the season, and the winner makes the state tournament. And these guys won their blood around matches within 10 minutes of one another. Um, it was an absolute season highlight. It was the kind of rush that is very unique to sports. And uh, it was a really celebratory mood as they climbed from the, the competition floor back up to their parents and families and teammates to celebrate with them. So medals are hard to come by. These are only the 13th and 14th wrestling medals in Galesburg wrestling history. Um, I'm really excited to take two sophomores and roll into gyms next year with defending medalists in our lineup. And uh, I'm really proud of the way that these guys represent not only their school, but also their town. They do a great job. So thanks for having us. Hi, I just want to let you know that I'm uh, gleaming with pride because I get the honor of, in my opinion, talking about the greatest high school bowler, in my opinion, in Galesburg history, and Chloe Day. I put the one. <laughs> it is it is a great honor. It has been a tremendous four years. I feel like a parent losing a child going off to college. Uh, last year we thought we were going to state. We actually qualified to get to go to state last year, but with COVID they canceled the bowling tournament at state. So we set our goals for this year, and we knew this being the senior year that was a big goal we needed. To, we needed to get there and prove to everybody what kind of bowler we had. And I would like you to know that every bowling record at Gelford High School is now owned by Chloe Day. <laughs> run down some of those. I'm not going to give the numbers because I didn't bring my glasses and she knows who I am. Uh, but she has high three game, high six game. She has the um, record for the highest pin count in a season. She has the highest pin count in an extended season. She has won so many medals in tournaments in first place in those that I don't think we have time to list all of those. I truly do believe in that. Uh, We've had the opportunity and the four years that Chloe has been with us to win the Hometown Heroes twice, which I'm also very proud of that. She had a hand in and that, that we're very proud of. Chloe has always been a person who sets uh, goals and she goes after those goals. And she's one of those people that are so phenomenal, she accomplishes every single one of them. So she knew every record that was there. <laughs> we talked about the response as our freshman year. Look out. <laughs> and so as the years went, went by, each one of those records were getting broke. And then finally, the last year, she started breaking her own records. And her final goal this year was to get in the top 10 in the state uh, finals. 
And along that journey, we uh, had quite accomplishments along the way. We went through regionals, and we were lucky enough to have two of our bowlers uh, receiving all conference, with Chloe being the number one uh, bowler at the regional. And then she went on to, from there with sectionals with two bowlers. Ellie Chin was our other bowler. She was a, she's a junior. And Ellie uh, missed out by 30 pins by making it on the state. And those of you who know much about bowling, that's just a couple of spares. So she came very close to going with Chloe. And so then we moved on to sectionals. And at sectionals, I can't remember how many bowlers. We're talking in the hundreds. We're talking a lot of bowlers at these meets. And the top bowler at sectional, not only regional, but at sectionals, was Chloe Day, first place. Makes you feel good. I do. Just makes you feel so good and so proud and happy for these kids and their accomplishments. So then we went on to state, and our goal was focused on the top ten. That's all she'd wanted. That was the last record. The record for Gilbert High School highest advanced, but at the state tournament was 11. So she won it in the top ten. And so on the first day, it's a two-day tournament in Rockford. And I believe there was between four and 500 bowlers, something like that, 500 bowlers. We're talking about a huge tournament. And this is not a tournament where they separate out the class uh, as far as well, how big your school is. It's every school. It doesn't make a difference how large your school is. Everybody competes at the same tournament. <clears throat> uh, at the end of Friday, we were in 29th place. And we were a little bit worried. I was anywhere. Way. I had confidence, but I was still worrying a little bit. And she knew she could do it. I could tell the look on her face that she knew she was doing everything she could on that final day, on that Saturday. And by the end of the tournament on Saturday, she had gone from 29th place and finished out of 500 bowlers, she finished seventh place. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'd like, because I always do this at our banquets and stuff, because I think it's a huge thing that people realize that. Uh, Chloe also received another honor this year, and that was all conference academics. So that was also. Uh, I would like to have Chloe speak for a few minutes. <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to speak directly to the board about something. Um, I am extremely grateful that this program has kept going to the many years where it might have been cut. And I'm extremely grateful that it kept going. And I know that it was talking about being cut before I even got to high school. And I cannot imagine where I would be right now in my career if I didn't have that. I'm currently signed to the number two ranked women's college bowling team in the whole country. And I do not think I would be able to get that far without your support of the bowling team. So I hope that you continue to support the team come the coming years. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, next up is our presentations. Is Thank you. I won't touch the microphone uh, like Mr. Matthews did last <laughs> last month. It's, it's standing again. So, but that goes to the unsung hero back there, Mr. Mike Cooper. He doesn't get a lot of respect in regards, oftentimes. I think so. Respect. He's gonna kill me for that, but he deserves it. So, I'm here to talk about Churchill Junior High School. Uh, this is my first year as principal at Churchill Junior High School. Um, I'm proud uh, of some of the things that we've accomplished thus far. I'm also um, uh, just really looking forward to continuing that work 
as we progress into the years to come. So uh, without further ado, uh, we have three goals uh, to support the board's goals that they've laid out for this, this year. Um, our first goal takes a look at the number of students that are above grade level in mathematics. Um, we have a pretty lofty goal to raise that from 11% overall mean year exceeding to 31%. Um, we're going to use the, IR, the iReady Diagnostic to progress monitor that, which we have been doing, and I'll have some re results for you in a moment. Our second goal, uh, real similar to the first goal except with reading, uh, we're looking at jumping from 48% of students who are overall mean year exceeding to 68% uh, using the Scantron Diagnostic to progress monitor uh, that. And then our third goal has to deal with attendance. Um, and certainly, uh, we have a pretty lofty goal. Uh, the SIP team at Churchill decided on 93% because that was uh, uh, a standard that was before kind of pre-pandemic and COVID, uh, pretty lofty. Uh, at the current midterm rate, we were at 88%, so we're, we're certainly falling short of that. Um, I don't think we took into account that there was still some illness and sickness that would be going on, uh, you know, even as we've crawled out of the pandemic. So we're doing pretty well. Um, I know there's far worse rates than that, but certainly we can have room to improve there. So looking at our first goal that dealt with mathematics, um, I, I'll give you some background there. Currently, uh, we have, like I said, 11% of students that are meeting or at grade level benchmarks, and another 30% that are on the bubble. Um, so those kids that could be either one grade level or below, are on grade level, so we're really trying to target those kids and get multiple kids in all grade level bands to move up. I'll show you those bands in a moment. Uh, we're doing that by looking at, uh, through our Ready Math program, certainly a new curriculum to a lot of students, uh, hot word here lately. Um, we've tried to revamp our executive functioning class, and I'm gonna to explain to you what that class is in a moment as well, and how, how we're using that. And then also just, um, you know, the conversation's about us. Um, you'll see some scoreboards here in a, in a bit, and what we know and the purpose for the scoreboards are when you talk and everybody knows about goals, 80% of the time you're going to meet them. So we've learned that through some training, so we really tried to blast that and plaster all that across our school, a lot about our goals. So students, staff, um, and, and parents as they walk in, you'll see a big board uh, with our goals. So currently, at our latest, um, most recent diagnostic, the winter diagnostic, we had jumped up to 20%. So um, we're about halfway to our 31% goal. So I think we're on pace, that's excellent. Um, that's a testament to our teachers and the hard work of our students. Um, and I think that that executive functioning, what we're doing in that class is starting to pay off in addition to what the curriculum is providing us in the regular classroom. Um, so I'll show you some numbers uh, here with math. So the top, bar there, so you see the green, the yellow, and the red. Um, the darkest red uh, is students that are multiple three or more grade levels behind when they came to us uh, this year. That, that's 44% if you can't quite read it. Um, the lighter shade red is 14% of students that are two or more. Um, you can see just by looking at that top bar and comparing it to the winter math diagnostic that we shrunk that number. That's a good thing, we wanna keep going in that direction. You can also see that the green bars, the one with the striped lines and the solid one, combined to make about 11% in the top one. Those are students that are either on grade level or mid to above grade level thus far. Uh, you can see that those have increased as well. So we're making great progress at both ends, shrinking that achievement gap. Uh, what you don't see here, and some numbers I want to provide you also, are as we look at subgroups, um, specifically our achievement uh, gap of African American Hispanics. Uh, our Hispanic group has made ridiculous jumps this year. It, it's fantastic if you look at our data on ECRES. Um, basically, um, they are not only meeting their expected growth, they're starting to hit some, hit some of their stretch growth. So uh, looking at those subgroups is exciting. And also, which isn't typical, our African-American students are progressing and pacing at the same pace as um, some of our white students. So that's excellent news to have. So we will continue to monitor that uh, in the math, math goals. Um, and I can watch a reading as well. Reading, our, our goal, uh, again, was to increase uh, students, the number of students at or above grade level by 20% school-wide to 58% overall. Uh, we are using the Scantron to progress monitor. This, is, again, is a diagnostic that we do three times a year. Um, our most recent one was done in the winter, uh, here in January. 
Um, we are taking some action plan steps again in that executive functioning, and we're really trying to focus on our nonfiction reading. Um, we notice that students uh, struggle in those areas, specifically in comprehension. Um, so we are using a couple of free resources, Common Lit and Newzella, um, or New ZLA, depending on how you state that. Um, these are allowing us to not only give students content that's relevant to them, um, they can choose an article that's interesting, interesting to them, um, but it's also giving us a short diagnostic piece each time they do it, so we can track that as a SIP team. Um, so currently we're at 38% overall, we're not quite on pace, uh, but certainly showing improvement there uh, looking at that, that uh, results. As you can see here, um, this is interesting because we've been pretty stagnant um, in the red area, but our green is continuing to grow, uh, which is what we want. We want that to just really be all green, about 80%. We want all to be 100% green, truthfully, but um, we, are, we are progressing in the right direction um, you know, towards our goal. So that's, that's excellent. So again, kudos to our students and our staff. Our last goal dealt with attendance and truancy. Uh, as I mentioned before, 93% uh, was our goal. Um, that's a typo, I should say 88% with our midterm grade right now. Uh, we're not currently meeting that goal. Um, and there's a few reasons for that um, in my estimation. One, we have uh, many students that, again, are still struggling from the effects of COVID and recovering from that. Uh, we believe that their, their school stamina isn't quite back to where it was pre-COVID. Um, so trying to build up that, you've seen improvement in that, uh, but also we have just a lot of illness that's still still going around. So these are our attendance <coughs> rates as of they stand uh, this previous month. So 88% for the seventh grade, 87 for the eighth grade. Uh, the glaring number that concerns me most is that in the, the eyes of the state, if you have 10 or more absences, you're considered a chronic truant. 66 of our students at Churchill are considered chronic uh, truants right now. Um, so these are students that uh, we have, you know, really put a focus on. Uh, Mr. Pickerel and Outreach, these are ones that they're meeting with regularly, going to their houses, trying to encourage them to come. They may have went through the truancy review process with the ROE. Um, they're ones that, you know, if you've heard me speak at some of our, our uh, meetings with the public, we've really tried to drum up some mentoring support. So I've had Galesburg Fire Department in, Galesburg Police Department in. We're just trying uh, radio DJs. Alder, aldermen, uh, alder women, uh, uh, real estate people. So we're just trying to find interest of our kids. And I came about that stuff by pulling the students. What are you interested in? Who would you like to meet with? Um, and then, you know, thankfully we have people that are donating their time and coming in. So just trying to build the relationships that way. And what we do is we do a greet meet. Uh, you may have seen that in some of my board notes where we just provide an opportunity for students and those folks that volunteer their time just to come in and share a meal together. There's no agenda, there's no pressure. If you don't want to eat with the person, you don't have to, but most of the kids really like to learn about, you know, what's a fireman do on a daily basis or, or a police officer. So it's just pretty interesting. And it also spurs, uh, you know, that creative imagination of what they can do later in their life. So I think it's beneficial in, in many, many ways. So super proud uh, of, of Mr. Pickerel uh, with that work. But again, we have a long way to go. So I mentioned our executive functioning class earlier. Um, and what we do is we spend this time, if you may have, if you've heard advisory or advocacy, it's similar to that, except that this is a full period of our day. We spend that time with extra support and emphasis on improving our math and reading. Um, we have taken a step further this, this year, and this is maybe just my type A personality. I like to organize things so they're specific. And I think teachers really appreciate that too, knowing what you expect. So we took the schedule and we just said, this is what we want each day. So, for example, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you're doing 25 minutes of your I Ready My, my Pass. This is a designated path that's student specific. Um, staff is available to give student support as needed. But there's also a component where at the end of that, you're also doing some reading, so we're mixing it up as well. Uh, we do some math enrichment on the other days. Um, that could be little things like uh, flashcards, it could be uh, comprehension checks. Um, through, through the iReady Math program. There's just a lot of different things, excuse me, that students uh, you know, have the access to. We do some goal setting and some team building on Thursdays and SEL work as well. So this is where we do our three, sweet 360 work with the students, always under the guidance uh, of a staff member. Um, it allows students to really progress monitor and self-monitor, which is an important piece. 
I mean, anytime, I think if you set a goal for yourself and you're able to, to reflect back on that goal where you're at, it's more powerful than if someone else is telling you, you're not doing this or you need to do this. So we really try um, to embrace that and emphasize that in that class. <coughs> um, these are some of the scoreboard ideas I was talking about. So if you walk into Churchill, um, we've covered up one of the trophy cases with um, some reading and math data that I just shared with you. Uh, we also, you'll see some, if you walk in, you'll see some individual papers where we do those comprehension checks and we're always updating that about every three weeks. Also on the classroom door up there, you'll see attendance numbers. Um, so again, we're constantly talking about what the goal is, where we want to be, and then what the kids do is they calculate that attendance uh, every Friday for their first grade class. The kids do that. It's not something the teachers have to worry about. It's a real form. We gave them a sheet. Here's the formula. Here's how you do it. It's a learning experience for them, and then they can keep track of that. So every door in our building, if they have a first period, has this on there. Um, this is an example of someone that has 93% or above for, for that week. Uh, we have uh, another one that's below from 83 to 92%, and then one that's below. And that also gives us a visual of what classrooms that, you know, if I'm walking around, it's really easy for me to pop into a class that's doing a really great job and just say, hey, great job, let's keep up the good work, or at the same time walk into a classroom that may need some motivation and how I can help those kids. So a uh, real easy thing for us. So that's, that's proven real beneficial. Uh, we've also had, I don't run out of time, so I'm trying to hurry, um, some 1003A activities. This is a grant. If you remember, I believe it was three years ago, uh, we were designated as an underperforming school due to some attendance issues with our IEP students. Um, as a result, the, the state um, throws a bunch of money at, at you to help improve that. So we've tried to tie some of those activities into engaging parents and students and more uh, things that are, are uh, you know, what we, what we feel are, are we're going forward with in the future. So things like, um, Parent support groups. Mr. Devon Euros, our family engagement specialist, has ran two of these already this year. He runs one monthly. Um, it doubled in size from the first to the second. Um, and we let parents dictate kind of what they want to talk about. It's not what we're talking at them. They're talking to us and we're listening. So some of the uh, things that we've talked about thus far in the middle there, um, just some really important things that um, parents need support with. And it's kind of turned into almost if you've been to one, it's almost like a self-counseling session where people are just leaning on each other and going, yeah, my kid does that too. And it's, it's, it's just really beneficial uh, to have that. So good feedback for us as well. We also just recently had an exploration of college and career pathways night at the GAB Center for our incoming freshmen next year. So uh, thanks to Mr. Houston and his staff, um, the counselors at the high school, uh, parents were able to stop out with their students, ask questions. They were able to get their hands dirty. Some, some kids have never you know, flown a drone. Some kids have never used a, 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 a wrench, I mean, and things like that. So to put them those things in their hands and give them an experience, it just gives them an idea of the coursework that they can sign up for in the future. I think that's just a really valuable experience for them. So what's next? Um, so currently, this week, we are signing up our eight, current eighth graders for our freshman courses for next year. Um, the counselors came today, so I know there was some talk about that the last board meeting where we are at, so I wanted to update you certainly on that. Um, they're coming back on Thursday to sit down with the individual students on to sign up classes. Uh, we're also going to be finalizing our Gale Scholar and Upward Bound, Upward Bound Math Science programs. Um, this is really important. This is a free college opportunity for, for Galesburg students that doesn't really get taken advantage of enough in my opinion. So uh, if you have a student uh, that's an eighth grader, this is critical. Uh, have them talk with myself or Ms. Vanderbilt at the school. Uh, really, really important. We have our IR, ISA testing coming up. Additionally, we do some stuff with the Illinois Youth Survey to give feedback uh, to the state uh, that helps us uh, direct some of our programming. Uh, a new thing this year is the Zello Career Exploration. I think Mr. Houston's talked about that in the past. That's where um, students can log in and find mm -hmm. out um, you know, potential career paths for them uh, based on their interest. So an excellent program we're, we're doing now with our eighth graders. And then we'll be enrolling sixth and seventh graders, the incoming sixth and seventh graders for classes soon. The last two things that I think are of paramount are a celebration of Churchill. So with the school building closing, uh, we are in the planning stages of that. I have former teachers already on a committee that are helping me uh, do that. So uh, we have an activity that we're having quite settled on a date, but we're looking at May. Uh, when it's not too hot in the building and, and the weather's gonna be just perfect where we get folks in the building one last time to do a celebration. Uh, looking at doing a dance for students, uh, those types of things. 
And then finally, in August, we will be putting together a 7, 8, 9, really a 7 through 12 orientation night because we know many students that are coming out there, this will be a new experience for them. So the ability to get them into the building, uh, walk around. So we have a lot on our plate coming up, certainly in the next few months, uh, but we're excited about the challenge. So I've talked for way too long, so I appreciate your time. Any questions? When you said your attendance is 88% and it's grown but not as much as you wanted, what was the first semester? The first term? We were, we've were we been pretty stagnant. We really have been around 87, oh, okay. 88% all year. And I really, we really were, I guess, ambitious in that 93% goal. We, you know, how we arrived at that number was looking at, again, pre pandemic numbers, and that was probably foolish on our part. Um, looking at the map, you're talking about the subgroup, um, mm -hmm. African American and Hispanic, that it jumped quite, jumped quite a bit. Um, can you attribute that to anything in particular? Was there something different that was happening? Uh, I think it, one, it's our curriculum with the iReady Math program, um, and also the, the work of our teachers in the executive functioning class, where we're actually spending, you know, more minutes a day than just getting the regular the regular class setting. So they're actually getting. Uh, you know, not only that direct instruction in the classroom, but if they have questions, they have the ability to go over that with another teacher at another time. Um, oftentimes, uh, our students don't have quiet places to, to work at home at the end of the day. So we also have a tutoring program that I think has been beneficial. Um, that's open to all students on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, I didn't mention that, so I think that's another powerful piece, piece that's, that's there. But um, yeah, those are exciting numbers. I hope that they continue, continue that trend. And then another thing that uh, I wanted to talk about too is you were mentioning that you started bringing community members in mm -hmm. um, different professions as an, as an example. What's another way that um, you as a board might be able to better support um, our seventh and ninth grade, you know, from now to the end of the year, also going in and trans transitioning into the 712 building with our junior high? What is it that you need more support with as far as, you know, behaviors and that just overall? that we can assist with, that this district you know, supports you with? I don't know if I can you know, pinpoint one thing. There's, it just a lot depends on the certain day sometimes. I mean, certainly getting the scheduling going, I think is gonna help ease a lot of tension, both with students and staff, and we're heading that direction. I mean, a lot of our staff certainly wanna know where am I gonna be, what room am I gonna, am I gonna be in next year? So there's some of those things that, that we are working through. I don't want to sound like we're not, but um, I think there's just a lot of anxiety right now amongst the staff in that regard. And also to our students that are going into a brand new building, you know, they haven't seen. So I think more of these orientation nights, more of the ability to go out and explore what we have, the more we can do that, the better. Um, I think that's just going to prepare them for next year more. Um, in terms of like behavior and like attendance and things like that, I think we have um, the right people in place and the right positions in place. I just don't know, you know, how much, you know, education is valued anymore as in, 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 in regards to my to my time, I guess, and times before me. There are other things that are pulling away from education. This is Nick Young, the personal opinion speaking, not the, not the principal, I want to make it clear, but I just think that there are other things out there that are stealing the attention of school. And we're fighting, and I'll give you a, a, one example, cell phone, social media, it's just constantly, we're battling, battling that constantly within our school and it's it's disrupting classes it's it's being used for, for negative things like recording fights um, so just as we as we look at um, you know code of conduct and things like that those are things that we want to consider how, how we want to approach that um, so from from your guys standpoint I think that would be, be very helpful um, mr. guy I noticed again 66 students that are considered chronic truant so that's pretty substantial. That's about 12% of your student population. And you listed a whole bunch of things that we're doing to engage those students. Is anything in particular reaching those students to get them back in the classroom, or are they continuing to be chronically true? I don't have any you know, strong data here that says one thing or another is working. I wish I had that to provide to you. Um, what, what I can tell you is what we're trying isn't good enough right now. So um, that, that's putting it bluntly. If we have 66, that's 66 too many. And um, I think oftentimes, again, there are things that get in the way of getting kids to, to school. The, the thing that you're not seeing are 
you know, the 35 kids that are lined up every morning at the front table that are late to school, that aren't marked as chronic transmission plow late. And um, that's concerning to me because then they're walking into class late and they're disrupting other, other students learn, learning. So um, there's a lot of, of, you know, other things that I guess that aren't often seen that, that concern me that we're trying to work through. And it's, you can consequence the daylights out of students. You can, you can um, be positive to students. Um, those things tend to run their course until there's, you know, that internal motivation. And we talk about this a lot at our board meetings, you know, that internal motivation to want to do something, want to be part of something. That's what I'm trying to reach kids with the mentoring. That's what I'm trying to reach kids with, with the interest surveys. And, you know, if I'm interested in something and if I love it, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there on time to do it. So I think that's our best bet right now going forward. So, you know, some of this GABC work and things like that, you know, we have students that, Two plus two isn't isn't their jam all the time. They want to get their hands dirty. So, you know, I, I applaud you for expanding that program and, and doing that building. That's wonderful. We have kids that I had a kid today that came to me in the hallway and was like, I, I love music. Is there any way can, we can do a music club? And the immediate answer is yes, absolutely. I'm never going to tell a kid that they can't do a club. It's just, you know, finding time to do that. I, I told them, here's what you need to do: find a teacher that's willing to do that. We're going to do it. And if no one wants to do it, you come find me. And if it's me spending time after school, I'll do it. And it's, um, that's why I got in the profession. So really just driving those interests of kids and, and trying to just build on that. That's, I think, our best shot. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next we have another presentation that's not on the agenda. Uh, last minute edition, a gentleman from Clean Energy Design is gonna speak to us about, uh, there you go. Yeah, the podium's fine. Just make sure to speak into the microphone. Good evening. We'll start off with the uh, update on Silas. <clears throat> Construction uh, uh, <laughs> You see the side plant? There we go. Okay, we've got the, uh, for Silas Willard, we've got the side plan uh, finalized. Uh, we've got the interconnection uh, now from the utility, and we're now waiting on the geotech reports coming back uh, from engineering so that we know what depth to put the uh, piles for the support of the uh, carport. Is, is, is this, can, you get, can everybody see this okay? Yes. So this will be, and we'll show a picture of what the actual steel looks like that the carport uh, will be placed on. But this is the layout, and that equates to 82 uh, KW solar system, which is 152 solar panels. And that will all feed uh, directly into the building behind the meter. And that will help offset uh, one for one uh, kilowatt hours that the uh, school is currently buying from the utility. So that's on schedule uh, to start sometime in May. And we'll do some coordination with everybody for the parking okay. lot. But, uh, that's, that is on schedule now. So that's I uh, uh, just wanted to present that to you and let you know how that was going. Is the okay. schematic that shows it as well, or just that picture? That's the site plan. Um, the, the engineering for that isn't quite done, but when that is done, I will get it to Dr. Aspen and he can circulate it uh, to the board members. Oh, I just, oh, I just wanted to comment that, you know, having construction in May, we're still in, in school in May, so either we need to coordinate with the staff to Yes, we'll, we'll coordinate that. We'll be able to coordinate to start right after school's out so that, you know, we can, but there'll be some preliminary things we can do on the building and so forth in preparation for the connection. Okay. So we'll, we'll definitely uh, not be doing the parking lot during school. So you horizontally drill the line all the way into the building then? How does the... Yes. There's a couple of more spots, and that'll go right over to the behind the building for the location. What's the time frame for flipping the switch for the line? 
if all of our parts come in for the for the electrical portion of it, uh, we'd like to be done before school starts at the end of the fall. Be 100% turned on, you know, everything done is, is our goal. And we believe we can make that happen. Um, uh, I was gonna give you another update on the current system, but, but and I'll, I'll lean back to the availability of transformers and things like that. But, they, they say it has a certain lead time and then they show up that it's not the case that that's the correct lead time. So that's creating a complete chaos. But uh, that's the goal is to get it done before school starts. <coughs> Tim, for the audience that may not know, this is for uh, covered parking in the Silas School or parking lot with solar panels on top of it. So kind of serving up a dual function for us. <laughs> You're gonna have to have a lottery for the parking spots. <laughs> so that's that's uh, Silas Willard. Um, the next uh, uh, update, which I don't have a slide on, um, is the system that's that's actually in place. Um, we have everything needed to make interconnection to the utility, with the exception of the trigger. And the transformer is scheduled to be here in three to four weeks. And that was ordered last July. So other than that, we're ready to, to energize it. And then the uh, subscription can kick off. So subscription start after it's energized? Yes. So where's the power go once it's energized though? There'll still be, um, there'll still be a credit for that. All the energy that is produced to go along the grid or to the utility, that'll be a reference credit that will then be distributed through community solar and the subscription program. So it's kind of like, I guess, a bank until that's utilized uh, through the utility source. That's a stretch. So will we be able to sign people up before the end of the school year? Yes, yes. We uh, have another uh, slide. Uh, let's see. That's that's a good that's a good one too. We can start there. <laughs> this is a map. Um, remember last year, pretty much all of Galesburg was eligible for the subscription program. January first with the redistricting, it now has only this area and that area. Here's the railroad track going through diagonally through the center of town. But these are the two areas that are eligible for that subscription for the low income now. Redistricting by who? The, the census. What's the northern boundary then? What road of trees is that? Um, <laughs> uh, I'll have to, I'm not like, sure. I can't. Yeah. You don't know the eastern boundary then either. So the color really doesn't mean anything, right? Well, we will, uh, when, when it all happens, this is really just to show you that'll be the area of focus for the subscriptions by the company that are uh, trying to derive to, uh, subscriptions. That's the area that they're going to target. And then we're going to also have a kiosk or a uh, Computer here dedicated for folks that don't have access to a computer. If you come in and sign up online uh, here at uh, at the district office as well, that Dr. Aspen and I have discussed, and we can send you the in addition. So the shaded areas don't don't mean anything. Well, the shaded areas are the areas that have the uh, have been designated that qualify for uh, low income subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Just like that. There's some two adjacent ones. It's not the two adjacent ones. The, the two blue areas. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. I wish we moved that street here. We'll get more details, correct? Right? Yes, yes, sir. Absolutely. Right. Great. Yeah. Okay, this is the 
fact sheet for the community solar sign up. Um, we'll obviously distribute this. Um, but here's all of the uh, advantages, uh, no long-term subscriptions uh, needed. Um, they can go to info at cd.us and they will be put on a, uh, be given a detailed list of what, what is needed to submit. And that will start off the subscription process. So this is what goes to families? Yes. We spoke to someone, some company, sometime. We were told we have that English, Spanish, and French. Is that still the case? Oh, absolutely. That would be no problem. We, there's still a little bit of uh, uh, work to be done on the process, but we're getting very close. And obviously, uh, we're excited to get that to you as fast as we can so that uh, folks can start signing up as soon as possible. Let's see. So I think that's about it. Thanks for some other questions. Yeah, any questions? So so where's the fence going up if all the electrical stuff's done? That was a serious question. I know. I'll put an answer it seriously. Good. Um, back to the, the lead train issue. There's all sorts of equipment sitting out there. Well, no, there's, there's, there's some fence there, but that was from the original project. Yeah. So the new fence to surround the entire system mm -hmm. is ordered. We're waiting for updates on lead time to get in the, uh, the fence. As soon as it hits, it's going in. Okay, and one of the I walked that property today, mm -hmm. I noticed in, when your equipment was all out there, the area to the east of the solar field is terribly rutted. Mm -hmm. You're you taking care of that? Yes. Yeah, that's all going to be uh, tilled and uh, graded and seeded. Great. Absolutely. Absolutely. It looks like I saw the questions. We'll, we'll be back with more information. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, next thing, a motion to approve the consent item. So moved. Second. Any questions or concerns? Allison? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Let's see. Uh, next on the agenda is the student council report. <laughs> I know that there has already been a lot of discussion and there will still be a lot to discuss after I'm done, so I'll keep it short. Um, I'm just going to talk about just two things that we have um, upcoming, um, which both occur on April 1st. The first being the blood drive that we're going to have. This is the third one um, with the American Red Cross in the GHS library. And then also again on April 1st, we're going to have the Shooting Hoops and Smiling fundraiser for these special athletes in field gym at GHS. That is it. What time is that at? Do you have a time? Um, I can check on that. Six o'clock. 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 Six o'
and audit of GHS courses. We just spent, the high school staff, Ms. Robinson actually mentioned some of this, reviewing our math curriculum and those uh, courses there at the high school. Removing ones that we didn't have a lot of student interest in and then having the departments that add curricular interests as well um, and also increasing our AP offerings this fall. A well-rounded child, we wanted arts problem solving um, opportunities. So we've increased STEM, we started music at the fifth grade level. So we have band and those things starting at those at those very young ages. Um, what is taught and how it is taught was another focus and key finding from that report. We made a concerted effort on professional development for staff and the integration of instructional based strategies that are based on research. Um, additionally, we talked about needing interest and in surveying for our students to see what clubs and activities they wanted to be engaged in. That survey went out, Mr. Matthews was instrumental in that, Mrs. Ham was instrumental in that as well. Uh, and we were able to create new clubs and activities based on that feedback. Um, we also talked about increasing our career pathways and support for planning, enhancing um, our career guidance and support. Uh, Mr. Young mentioned Zello, which is a new online opportunity for us to get student interests right away. Um, we also have ongoing work ready um, graduation requirements. We increased our course offerings and alignment. You saw the enhanced GABC Center. Uh, we also talked about, uh, another finding was the evaluation of instructional design, delivery, and deep thinking, working on problem solving. So you heard, even tonight, ready math and really digging deep into the data to know what students need um, and remediating those deficits, but also challenging those students that are ready to move on. And we've given them those pathways to that iReady model. Uh, we also talked about the science of reading, and we've invested a lot of dollars and time with teachers learning the most instrumental research-based practices to help all students read and read proficiently. Um, additionally, phenomenon-based science, so hands-on interactive science at the K-8 level and offering a variety of courses there, including increased opportunities for AP, uh, monitoring of student data and increased interventions and support. And we've also reviewed the use of instructional time and made sense-making blocks so that if students are in specials at an elementary, that they have that time and it's not I want to put it parsed out in 15 and 20 minute increments. It was very thoughtful um, and, and we wanted to make sure they were manageable chunks of time along with breaks for movement. Uh, additionally, we talked about clean buildings and a location, one location for all Galesburg Junior High students to start. Uh, we've, we've accomplished that actually with Lombard Middle School starting fifth grade, all students are Galesburg Silver Streaks at that point. Um, and upgrading all of our facilities. You can see our building projects which are coming to fruition and actually projects are ending. Uh, and then also student voice. We've had students on our committees for all of our scheduling. Uh, we've also had our school improvement and our school uh, and our involvement. Uh, we have students on the older levels of school improvement boards. Um, we also are asking surveys. I went out with a group of people in the um, spring, and we actually were able to survey students during the cafeteria in the cafeteria during that lunch time to see what their thoughts were as we were moving into the 712 uh, opportunity. So that kind of gave us some buckets, if you will, to uh, focus our efforts on, which includes refining and broadening our curricular offerings for instruction and curriculum, um, focus on a building and facilities to make them 21st century learning spaces that are air conditioned and comfortable for both staff and students, and enhancing our instruction for deep learning. That involves a review of our schedules, the strategies we're using, the courses we are offering, um, and so, I want to make sure that the community is aware that the work began to address this starting back in 2017 with that Vision 2030. Uh, we had buildings and grounds committees. Uh, we also had a 712 scheduling committee that I was able to help facilitate. We had 42 members on that committee with parents, teachers, administrators. Um, I even pulled um, business owners to help with that. 5-6 uh, scheduling committee had an equally large number of teachers and uh, parents roughly around 20, and then the K-4 committee had 20. I think the, the thing that I appreciate the most is during this time we had negotiations with our union, and it was so important to both the union and the board that we focused um, section 29.1B in our contract on page 36 where it states, in the 22-23 school year, we will have an eight hour day for staff, which meant that we needed to revisit while we're doing these schedules what that instructional day looks like. Uh, so our schedules went to seven hours and 15 minutes based on this curricular work uh, with the committees. Uh, and another piece to also remember is that the board initiated goal setting for us. So as you saw in uh, Mr. Young's presentation, we talked about chronic truancy. That is a goal for all buildings. Uh, additionally, reading and math. So we've increased our outreach and SEL support services. 
uh, to address the chronic truancy, reading and math, we've done realignment of our curricular plans on those levels. Uh, we're also purchasing resources to support teacher instruction. Uh, additionally, we have an algebra readiness goal, making sure that our eighth graders are algebra ready. So the I ready piece helps to advance or mediate that, moving more students towards that mark. Um, additionally, the last board goal was to be college ready, uh, which meant you saw in our presentation last month where we talked about leveling up. We want to increase the courses that we offer at the high school uh, while also adding supports. Uh, I mentioned this multiple times, increasing those AP opportunities, expanding our GAVC, and essentially leveling up so students can take those rigorous courses and still have a soft place to land knowing that, you know, they had the opportunity to try hard things and still were able to be recognized for that excellence. So I think that's important to note. Any questions for me? <laughs> Quite a bit. Well, I was trying to sum up five years, so I mean, yeah. um, so I'd be looking at the TV thing. No, I'm glad that you did that because I think that um, one of the, um, sitting at this table for seven years, I think one of the things that we attempted to do with our agenda, right, is to focus our agenda on our, our goals and, and focus areas that came out of those community engagement meetings. And we don't often take the time to go back to that list in that way and say here are the direct correlations over the last several years on how that work has continued and where we're at now and so i appreciate that you took us down a little bit of memory lane because um i do sense that oftentimes and and we've had a lot happen in the last several years um COVID interrupted a lot of things um the focus on health and safety, the focus on those things has probably drawn us away from those conversations and making those intentional connections. And so for some people who may not have been in the district at the time in 2017, people who have rightfully been focused on other things may have um, forgotten that all of the work that we're doing is in direct relation to those community engagement meetings that we had in 2017 and that this was this work is informed um, by many voices that have been represented through throughout that time. Thanks. Seems great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, next on the agenda is the special education report. Um, good evening. You have the report that uh, Luann, my assistant director, put together for us. Um, one thing to note is every year the special ed were required to do what's called the child count. Uh, the official date that they use for that is December 1st and through that child count again this year uh, we are on a constant decline in the number of students in special education. We have um, decreased again by about 19 students from last year that are in special ed for a variety of reasons. Um, one is we're proactively getting students out of special ed and back into general education environment uh, through the MTSS process and the programs and curriculum that the district is now utilizing. And we continue to have a high rate of students who transfer in and out. And sometimes it's the same student transferring in uh, multiple times. So um, other than that, uh, we did do the annual needs assessment that we're required to do for our grants. And again, it, it's the same systemic uh, areas of concerns. Uh, the heavy focus on the behaviors of the students that we're dealing with and I think just from the trauma that all of our students have experienced with COVID and shutdown and isolation and everything else we're seeing a high increase in some pretty significant behaviors of the students as they return so we're working with the SEL team on wheels and the SEL uh, group to try to address the needs of those students Questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, we need a motion to consider approval of uh, scheduling motion. Okay. Do you have specific questions on the schedule? I can start with K four if you. You yeah, have, so okay, you have, yes, you have a folder that includes the documentation from the committee meetings. We had 20 individuals 
involved in that, you'll see that on this first page. And you'll also see the document says K4 Specials Ideas Explained. That was from the committee. It was an easy way for you to kind of get a snapshot of the goal of this team. Um, essentially, we wanted to have PE every day. Uh, we're putting that on a rotational basis like we did this year. Uh, we now have STEM as well. But on the, on the second sheet, I would like for you to uh, uh, notice they asked for additional instructional time built into their school day. Um, on that second sheet, it says, much of our feedback expressed the need for more instructional time built into the school day. The proposed schedule provides an additional 45 minutes. The instructional day is proposed to start at 8, end at 3.15. This provides for 7 hours and 15 minutes in a school day, which is what I referred to earlier. Um, we also talked about recess during the lunchtime and then the additional recess throughout the day. Uh, we did want initially that built-in delayed start, but we see that that's not a possibility at this point. Um, but we are, I, I also want you to see our group think. At the very beginning, we had a once, what are the challenges, what are some of the questions that we need to ask? to overcome these obstacles. So that's just there for you. Uh, and I also left you with a presentation at the very end that was provided in December of this year as a reminder of this is the schedule. Are there still questions? So I just gave you that presentation with the older schedule. We have altered the times that I shared with member Sherpy. Um, I don't know what you want to are, ask are these about. The correct, times on this? the correct times are not on that because I wanted you to see exactly what was given to teachers. Okay. Uh, but since the board has requested the new times, I provided that to you. I don't know if you want to. I can pull that right up. White sheet teachers were not. That is what the team got. That's what the team in December. That was their feedback. So really, the new times. So the proposed time for K four is eight fifteen to three thirty based on the last email I sent you today. Yes. Yes, 8.15 in the morning to 3.30. Okay, I'm just gonna go through, I'm gonna go through all of it because I know everybody, this is what they wanna know. Yes. yes. This is when your students start their school. Their instructional day, the first time that the bell rings for them to be in the class, yes. So for K4, it would be 8.15 till 3.30. Yes. Where is she? 8.15. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. The ones that we're giving you today are the revised ones. So the accurate is 8.15 to 3.30? Yes. Okay, my get that, 8.15 to 3.30. So the proposed was 7.50 to 3.05. Yes, it was. And now we're proposing 8.15 till 3.30 mm -hmm. for K4. And it currently, Students start at nine o'clock and end at three thirty. Three thirty. Okay. So let's just but the the difference is starting forty five minutes earlier for K K four. Okay. I'm gonna move on real quick since I got it right in front of me. Move on to Lombard, which is you know fifth and sixth graders. They would start at eight. Students start at eight a.m. And be done at three minutes. Correct. And the initial was seven forty to two fifty five. Correct. Yes. 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 Okay. So currently, Lombard, the students start at eight fifty and then and three forty and three forty. Yes. Okay. So they did actually be getting that early. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And then finally, at the high school, which next year will be 712, mm -hmm. uh, that students will start at 740. First period at 740. And they'll be done at 255. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And proposed, the first proposal is 835 to 350, correct? Correct. And I want to clarify that too. We were asked to look at those later start right. times by right. the board right. to say, here's the pros, here's the cons. And we felt that when we looked at all of these pieces, the cons far outweighed the pros at this point without further investigation. I mean, some of the comments that Mrs. Robinson actually shared were some of the cons I listed directly on that slide. So, I mean, those were concerns of mine. Additionally, you know, my con my concern about those students who work, who typically take a four o'clock shift, they would not be able to do that. 
Yes, we talked about that, and we talked about the number. I mean, we had a full spreadsheet last yeah. month about the number of athletes that would be absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and as much as I appreciate the board wanting me to look look through that information and see how it applies to us, at this point, we didn't feel like that was a change that needed to make to take place. I would be part of that. People uh, will be very happy with that because I think that's good. Mm -hmm. I also appreciate all the work that everybody did because when we ask you to just. <laughs> Do something we'll like that. Thinking, yeah, yeah we, we kind of offhandedly yeah. sometimes ask for stuff that requires a great deal of work for a great many people. And we do appreciate it because there, there, there is research data that's you know, about you know, high school students starting later. Absolutely. A lot of good information, but I don't particularly think that it's appropriate for us at this time. I agree. Modern <laughs> so are we we're voting on this schedule? I just wanted to clarify that we're voting. Right now. Yes. What we're talking about are the student schedules. The teachers would still be responsible either twenty minutes before and twenty five hours. Yeah, yeah, as per time. Junior Jones voting on start and end times for the three different so 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 right right now it's just the, the schedules. Correct. At, which would be which what, is what you sent us. What you guys do. It is. You'll just you'll just have to reflect the time. Right, yeah. Yes. Okay. You also have the updated uh, high school schedule with the new times. We were able to manage that, but we had to wait on a couple other bus issues, which is why we weren't able to give you the updated times on the K through six. So you should have that in this packet, updated. Yes. First page. Yes, it is. So they'll end up being able to have 50 minute periods. So if the K-4 start at 8.15 and we don't start till 8.50 now, correct, something like that, 45 minutes in the morning, the 45 minutes in the morning is still used for breakfast in the classroom announcements and morning meeting. No, 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 not a full 45 minutes. No. That's, what, that's what I was thinking because on this, the times are different, but it says from 7.50 to 8.35 is breakfast in the classroom announcements and morning meetings, and I think that that is a little too long for that. That's just part of what they'll start on at that point, and then they go right into their instruction. Okay. So yes, absolutely. Okay. Good I'm question. I'm just thinking that's a little too long for them not to be taken. I agree. Um, and so I just linked it into the top yeah. for you. And if the firm will still have the PALS program available before. We will. And I've also so talked to Mr. Sure. Sampson at the YMCA to increase some of our support there for the 7, 8, and 9 because the campus will be right behind him. And he's willing to help with even busing some students if they wanted to go early in the morning and getting them to school and then busing them back for some afternoon activities at a teen center that he's working on. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Do we have any more questions concerning the scheduling proposal? So the scheduling is basically just when people are starting and when they're ending the day. All the other issues between that site isn't part of this discussion, correct? What would you ask? So essentially, uh, member line, this is just the instructional blocks as you're referring to. Yes, so the schedules that I provided to you, uh, negligent of the times that are on the left-hand columns, you're looking at the instructional day. You see that there's 45-minute specials for the elementary on the rotational basis, offering those things at the top, art, music, STEM, those components. Uh, and then at the middle level, you'll see that they have their class periods, and then you see the lunch recess. Uh, grade five is at the top of that, grade six is at the bottom. And then seven, 12, you'll see it's broken up into the 50 minute periods along with the lunches and the advocacy. So really just the instructional blocks if you wanna think of it that way versus times. Okay, Allison? Yes. Aye. 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 Aye.
Yes. Okay. Next, we need a motion to consider approval of building start times. So moved. Second. Okay. And that was what I just read to everybody. Yeah. Do you want me to reread <laughs> re re it one more time for yes. the sake of this? So kindergarten through fourth grade will start at 8.15 and will end at 3.30. Fifth and sixth grade at Love Mart will start at 8, 8 a.m. and end at 3.15 p.m. And then the seventh through twelfth grade building will start at 7.40 a.m. and end at 2.55 p.m. Those are the proposed times. Will, will there be any changes to the Bart Futures? Yeah, no, not that not that we see at this point, no. And this is for the year, correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't that leave the high school schedule short five minutes? Mm -hmm. They go 740 to 240 right now, right? Mm -hmm. yes. so 740 to 235. I'm thinking it's a teacher day. Because the contract calls for 20 minutes before and 20 minutes after. We're not including that time within the component. This is just student contact time. So you have the 740 to 240 plus the 15 would give it to 255. It says, Dr. Springer, it says 25 before 20 after, correct? Contract is 20 before 20. It says 20 and 20. Yes, 20 and 20. Session 29.1. That's my concern. It's not adding up to the eight hours. It said at least 20 minutes, though. That's how we read it. And they wanted up to an eight hour day, correct? According to 29.1b. Yes, at least. No, I, I think that's accurate. It is accurate, yes. Okay. Good fact is seven hours and 15 minutes of student time and 45 minutes. And eight hours for a teacher day. Yep. No, it says at least 20, so you have to make up the five minutes on either side. It said at least 20. That's where you get, you can put the 25. Isn't the, isn't the isn't the teacher it's 20 before and 20 after is that correct? At, at least, at least. But in order to make up your eight-hour day, 25 on one end. Okay. The majority of that level of dealing with you. We want to get you to get this. Allison. Ready, guys? Yes. Five thirty. Aye. Two minutes. Aye. Pascal. Lyon? Yes. Aye. Okay, next need a motion to consider approval of high school credit recommendations. So moved. Second. Dr. Spurner. Are there any questions on the step down model that was provided to you? I also have uh, Mr. Hawkins and Ms. Escobar here as well to answer any questions you might have. Yes, I, on the credits for Class 2026. I'm sorry. I, what is the asterisk next to computer literacy denote? So in my email, that was related. I sent that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the response, it was that there was a new requirement for incoming freshmen that they had to have a one credit over the course of their four years by the time they graduated. That's an Illinois state requirement. There is no workaround on that as far as That's things fine. are concerned. Um, and to your other question about could we embed this in other ways, we could absolutely put it into other classrooms. I think that's a tall order for the classroom teachers who are trying to really focus on their content area um, to have to explicitly teach the technology. So we have two different pathways. We have emerging technologies one and two, which is more of like the exploratory um, component and then you have computer tech one and computer tech two which is also application based and those are all within the course guide at this point there's also the flexibility of them being semester courses so you can weave them in when they fit most appropriately for your schedule thank you mm -hmm. Allison Aye. Aye. Next on the agenda is building reports. Everybody's received them. Do they have any questions or comments? Okay. Next, 
Thank you to the administrators that provided the building report. Appreciate it. Uh, next, a uh, report from the Building and Grounds Committee. No pictures this month, but I will say um, the high school complex is coming on very nice. The north addition, um, if you haven't been down through there, please go through there. That, that, um, that's going to be amazing. Um, we did have a meeting with Russell and the construction of the Performing Arts Center and got pretty uh, direct on is that facility going to be done um, so that we can use it. Um, I have my fingers crossed. Um, there's a lot still has to happen in there. Um, I've been through there a couple times and I told them if the people sitting on the stage on their phone would get up and work, we might have it done. Um, that didn't sit very well, but I was serious. Um, there's just a lot of labor in there that doesn't do anything. Um, it appears to me, but I'm not a contractor, I'm a farmer. Um, so bear with us on that one. Trust us that we've got the heat turned up on the contractors to have that Performing Arts Center done. Um, it's going to be an amazing facility, um, and, but it needs to be done. Now, we do realize that the band and choir rooms probably for the start of next school year won't be completely done. Um, but the Performing Arts Center will be. Um, it's my understanding that some, just bear with me, Maury. Um, but every, the rest of the school will be done. Um, we are glazing the rest of the windows and that in the summer. Um, and some other things. So the high school project is coming along nicely. Also, if you remember last meeting, we approved the piping for the chiller. Um, so that'll be coming up here in April to, there'll be a point that they can uh, fire the, the chiller, whatever they got, have to do to, to test all that. So um, there's Brian. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know you were back in there. I would have bashed harder. No. <laughs> um, any, anything, any comments um, that you're aware of that, I, that I'm missing? I know. Everything is scheduled to be done before the start of school, okay. including the summer project, and auditorium, and band choir. Okay. So that is the goal. There was a couple, the reason I mentioned the band part is you heard the solar guy talk about lead times. There was a couple things in there that the lead times were stretching. Um, so I just want to set the correct expectations. But. Yeah. Did they get the concrete in the band wire? Yeah. Okay. As far as the chiller pipes, it's getting kind of warm out there today. Will we be able to turn the air conditioning on? Or? So it's my understanding, and Brian can answer this better, they have to get to a certain point in that building so that they can shut all doors and everything so that when they turn that on, the pressurization or whatever in the building has to be correct for all that to work correctly. Am I, is that layman's term how it has to happen? Yeah, eventually they're going to have to test and balance the whole system. But to show if I need to go in first and it's not completely done. Is it here? Uh, I don't know. I was on site today, but I didn't walk back there to double check. I'm going to let you know tomorrow. Thank you. Just tell her she'll share. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any questions or comments? Well, I will say in the North Edition, I think we'll be finishing putting all the floors down this week. They're really close. Just those glass guys, guys to finish the little pieces left good shape yeah modulate on the north side is getting close hopefully they're scheduled by the end of march to have that complete so that looks realistic whether it will be used by during that time it's up to the district but the furniture can sell for the time but too yeah. okay thank you Next, I need a motion to consider approval of the Bright Futures Contractor Award recommendations. 
So I'll move. Second. So this is the real reason why I stood up. Yes. yes. Oh, you have a question? No, go ahead. I get <laughs> um, So we received bids, uh, I believe it was last week. Russell scoped out everyone. Um, the recommendation is to approve all bids, including alternate number one, which was the repainting of the entire building on three sides, not the south side, but all the three visible sides. Um, the cliff notes is uh, the bids came in higher than what the estimate was, but there was really good turnout this time, which was a positive. There was at least two bidders on every single package and the grouping of those bidders for the most part were fairly close. Um, for the bidders that weren't close, Russell did do their due diligence to make sure that the contractor with the whole bid um, had all of the scope in the project. So this is just to remind everyone for the Bright Futures slash district office um, project, it's roughly 47,000 square feet of renovations, uh, including exterior improvements, which is the concrete around the building, and drive lane on the west side and the playground area to the west of the Bright Futures building. So the comment I'll make is yes, the bid came in higher um, and raised my eyebrows. Um, but when we look in the rears of when we did steel, um, same square footage, it was more money when we did steel than what we're spending for the square footage at the, at the Bright Futures building. So is it a lot of money? Yes. But it is in scope of what we did spend at Steel and, and King. Um, so we're getting a lot more. I think. Steel and King are great, but what's going on in the Bright Futures, we're, we're going to have a lot there that's going to be a lot to, for the kids' benefit and the, and the public's benefit. So I just want to make that clear that yes, it did and some of the um, assumptions when it was bid were some unknowns that uh, Russell had to do and, and lick it. Um, so it, it, yes, it came in more, but we're still okay financially and we are within the scope of what we had to spend in other buildings. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, there was a construction budget that was given to the board. We talked about that last month. Um, so what we did to make up the difference is we have SR3 money, so we're shifting our focus. We'll be putting in a budget amendment if the board approves this tonight um, to increase the SR3 funds uh, that go to the project to $7,725,804. And then that leaves the remaining $3,206 um, to be applied out of our fund 60, which is part of our one cent sales tax revenue. Um, so we feel very comfortable with with using the S or three to to make up the difference. The other thing that you're actually approving about six hundred thousand dollars more than the bids, and that is an additional contingency that Building and Grounds felt that they wanted there, given um, the number of unknowns at this point in time and given our economy. So just today, there were several companies that were talking about putting fuel surcharges on materials, we've seen material delivery surcharges. So we don't anticipate having to spend that money. There's a $397,000 contingency within the 10.4 million, but we're putting an additional 600,000 in there just in case, not knowing what's going to happen with fuel, transportation, price of goods, supply chain in the next few months. And that's also Rodney's skeleton money. So we don't know what we may find in some of those things in that building, same as a high school. So I wanted to make sure that we didn't have to come back to you for change orders and, and that. I wanted to make sure that this time that we had money, make sure we covered ourselves. Couple more questions. Because people have heard that the, this is over, right? Uh, are we raising taxes? No. no. Are we? Is our fund ratio still two to one? Yes, it's over that. And do we have our board policy uh, cash on hand for the days? Yes, we have over three hundred and fifty days cash on hand. And our board policy only states that we have to have one hundred eighty. Thank you. 
On the building at 940, have we done moisture assessment on the floor? Can I accept tile without a lot more money? Uh, we did. Russell actually did it, took it upon himself to do that, and we found that the moisture contact was above, so we built in the moisture mitigation into the bids okay. so that it wouldn't be a change. Later on. So it's all taken care of. Yes. And you're confident that the existing, that I'm still concerned about the HVAC that's in that building. There are um, a few mechanical units that we're keeping that were at about half their life when we tested them out. So it might be a future project 10 years from now to replace those individual mechanical units that are gonna be serving the corridor spaces. Um, there were two units that came up um, during design that needed to be replaced that are part of it. And then there is another three or four that are being removed and replaced. The main mechanical units that will serve the classrooms and the office spaces are brand new. Thank you. And I'll just point out as a reminder, we receive about $1.2 million after we pay our bonds in one cent sales tax. The only thing that we can use the one cent sales tax money is for capital improvements on buildings. So once we move past these projects, we are going to be accumulating um, a nice sum of money every year. With the buildings our size, something always is going to happen, kind of like your house. But that would be something in the future that we would definitely have reserves in Fund 60 from one cent sales revenues to, to cover in the future. Allison? Yes, Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Okay. Next, need a motion to approve the 2022 facility improvement contract award recommendations. So moved. Second. Okay. So last month, we asked the board to approve the 2022 capital improvements at Steel and various projects at uh, the current Galesburg High School property. There were two projects that we did not receive bids on, so we put those back out for bid. The first one was the athletic flooring in Wycall Gym, which needs to be replaced. And so that went out for bid, and we received a bid of $351,760 for the replacement of that floor. The second uh, work item that we did not receive a bid for was lockers, and we did receive two bids this time with the lowest bid at $152,000. So we're recommending that both of those projects be approved as part of the original scope for summer 2022. Are those lion lockers? No, they are not no, lion lockers. <laughs> lion was not uh, specified and allowed to bid. <laughs> so let's see what they do. <laughs> yeah. Any questions So Allison? Aye. Yes. Well, Aye. 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 Thank you, Brian. Well, I believe the, the next item the, is our approval of sale of Nielsen. Yes. Is that tabling that? Is that correct? We are tabling that. We will be having a special board meeting hopefully very shortly here correct. to uh, discuss the two bids that we received today and okay. take action on that. <laughs> Um, and next, we have a motion to consider approval of the revised facility use agreement with the city of Galesburg. So moved. Second. Mr. Matthews. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, sorry. So, we, we, I brought two facility agreements this year one with the city of Galesburg, that we normally do, and then there was a second one that we. I've been working with the city on uh, specifically with the tennis complex as far as capital projects um, that we would go together and we would partner and share that cost 50 percent so and one of the, the, the thing that's coming up soon is we, we need to resurface the tennis court so we're working on on that whole process um, so the city approved it but what what tony tony o did was he actually took both contracts and brought them together. So now we have one document and two separate documents. So that's that's one change. And then the other change is who I would report to. I think Tony O's title might have changed. So 
there's just a title change. And then the contract, instead of expiring in September, we moved it up to August. So we're trying to, so when we start the school year, we can start fresh. So that, that's, that's the changes. So it's just bringing two together so we have one document instead of having two separate. When are you looking at resurfacing the tennis courts? It would, it would, it would like to do it this summer. Is that something that we have to bid at that we need yeah, to start the process yeah, on? Yeah, it's, it's funny. Uh, there's only uh, only one company that, I, that I've been able to get a, an estimate bid. Um, and I've reached out to every athletic director I know, and, we, and they all use the same thing. For whatever reason, there's nobody else out there that resurfaced tennis courts. So I've been working with them, and then um, they've actually been out of the country, and they just got back. So uh, once this kind of fell into place, we'll kind of, when I talked with Dr. Asma, we'd have to have it fit out. But we would share that cost as a, as a community in the school district, so. Are you happy to like something, or is that? Um, well, that, that'll be probably the next thing coming. Um, I don't know the age of those lights. Um, it seems like we constantly have something come up. I know we're trying to get one replaced now for our upcoming first home match so that we can play out there. So um, the lights are older than the tennis courts. Yeah, so and that's transferred over there. That, that'll probably be surface. the next thing coming, but we got to get the playing surface up um, for now. Is there back plans down the road to put a restroom in that complex? Um, sure. <laughs> it's definitely something we need to look at. Yeah, we can look to, yeah. I mean, it would make things a lot easier because we we ran out porta potties for 10 out of 12 months, or, you know, right around there. So, yeah, I mean, it would, it would be helpful. Yeah. I know the players don't like changing uniforms in a porta potty. Yeah. And then uh, it happened to escort opposing team sure. players into. To our building so they can use it. We can put that on building and grounds and, and kind of get an idea of what something like that would cost. Sure. Yeah. I just also wanted to thank Mr. Matthews because he worked with the city and before it really did not outline who paid for capital projects. It talked about the city's commitment with the lights and so this is able, he was able to bring to us an agreement that allowed for a 50 50 split of those capital projects. So I appreciate that. That's yeah, because we really pretty much agreement. assume all the cost of, of everything out there. So I thought it was, and they agreed, but this is fair. I mean, we both we both use that facility quite a bit. So being able to have that partnership of 50% I mean, made sense to me, and they agreed as well. So it'll, it'll be beneficial. And in the contract, it says they have act, the community's access. The field house for watching. How many people take advantage we, of that? We've never had it oh. since. Well, we put it in and then COVID, so it's 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 kind of fallen to the wayside because we we've, we've never been able to uh, to kind of put it. So we'll see you next year. Yeah, yeah. potentially. Yeah. yeah. Allison. Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Point of order, President Sherpy. Yes. Just like to just like to remind everybody to use their microphones so that the recording can pick us up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, I need a motion to consider approval of the 22-23 school calendar. Second. Okay. We've all seen the calendar for at least a couple of meetings. Any questions or concerns? Allison? Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 I swear, I get no respect at this table. Aye. Okay, next we have a discussion of the 22-23 fee proposal. It, it's very simple, yes. Yeah. So um, I'd like to thank the board for making this one of my tasks throughout the year very simple because we don't have any fees, so there's nothing to discuss. The only change that is on here is that each year we do have to increase uh, the school lunch and breakfast fees by 10 cents. 
And so we did that, but those are only for additional meals and for adult meals. So once again, all of our students are eligible for free breakfast and lunch, so no one has to pay. Um, but if an adult wants to purchase a meal or a breakfast, we do have to increase those. So that is the only request. There's nothing to vote on tonight. Uh, we're still planning on um, doing school supplies for all of our students. So literally, it is a free education when you come to Galesburg. There is nothing there's nothing for your family to pay. That's, so, that's like most school districts, right? It is, like, <laughs> it is like no other school district. In fact, in the state of Illinois, we are the only one that I'm aware of that has zero fees. Wow, that's excellent. So we'll ask you to vote on this. What a novel idea. Public education, free, right? <laughs> Next, I need a motion to consider the approval of the GABC equipment disposal. No, just get on. Yes. Oh. oh, another discussion. The district activity accounts discussion. Okay. All right. So, in front of you, you have a list of activity account changes that we're recommending. Once again, we're not voting on this tonight. These are just recommended changes. A couple years ago, when we closed Gale and Nielsen School, we really changed and kind of altered um, our elementary activity accounts to reduce those down to three per, per school. And there were some accounts from GHS that just simply had not been used for years and years and years. So the proposal is, is that for those accounts that we're looking to close, that those would be transferred into a 712 CIS account, which is also an activity account but that is for the principal to use for the benefit of curriculum instruction and students. Well, so CIS. CIS, curriculum instruction and students, yes, yes. The other um, item that we'll be asking you to vote on next month is to um, create accounts for the class of 2024, 2025, and then spring concessions. As part of the new collective bargaining agreement with the GEA, we've created a spring concessions that was never um, an activity before that was we only had winter and fall um, and we have lots of activities that happen in the spring and unfortunately for track and softball and baseball parents they all had to do their own concessions so this year we're treating that the same as we have all of our other sports and there will be a concession manager so we track uh, each season separately so that the clubs and activities that work that get the profit off of that so we just need to create a second or a third, excuse me, uh, activity account for that. <clears throat> so there are lots of um, lots of accounts in here. Um, if you have questions over the next month, please let me know. Um, this is an actual Skyward report. This one, the negatives are actually a positive. So that's it, it's the way that it. I know it's it's very strange, but negative means positive. It's good. Uh, where the activity accounts are concerned. So, what is um, a Q? A Q account is so at the end of each fiscal year, whatever line items have um, surplus revenues in them get swept into a general pot of money. So, that becomes your reserve for your fund 10. There are certain Q accounts where we carry over those balances because we want to track that money specifically. So if we didn't do that, for instance, band has a Q account. That money that is specifically set aside for band, which is part of the gate receipts from football, would get swept up into the general revenue account. And we don't want to do that. We want to track that money from year to year. So we have Q accounts for that specific reason, but they're housed within the F fund. Thank you. All of these accounts that we're closing up can no longer be used. Correct. Because they're Churchill and Lombard and some of these clubs are no longer clubs? Correct. Okay. And with GHS, so from my understanding, from what we can piece together, uh, back in the day when money was tighter and the district wasn't supporting things as they did, each department had an uh, activity account that they would do many fundraisers. If the business department had a huge vending machine that sold pencils and pens and notebooks and things like that. So at this time, those are not used because, you know, we have ample supplies. Mm -hmm. So we had $110,000 in instructional supplies alone from Title I this year for, for GHS. So all of those needs are being met uh, through, through the district at this point in time. <laughs> 
First of all, I'm just going to pick random. It says GHS library as a figure has been transferred to 712 CIS account. What if the library needs to buy something? If the library needs to buy something, they will go to the principal, Mr. Hawkins, and he can take that out of that curriculum instruction and student account. But the library, for instance, um, what is comprised in that account is from years and years and years of overdue book fees that go into that generation of there, or lost books or damaged books. Um, but we get about $4,000 a year from the state of Illinois for new book replacement. And so, once again, if that isn't enough for our K-12 needs, then it could either come out of the curriculum instruction activity account, or as I said, we have lots of title money that we're devoting towards curriculum that it could also be purchased out of there. Lots of different options. So what's the dollar figure then that's gonna to go to the 712 CIS account? Well, it fluctuates, so I will get that for you. It literally fluctuates on a daily basis. So um, this was a point in time on 3-8 of 22. Um, so we're literally, in some accounts, depositing still on a regular basis. So I will get you that final figure. We'll cut it off at a point in time. I'll take questions. Can you give us an example of an account that is still moving and why we're closing it? Um, for instance, like vocal music. Okay, okay, so they may have um, like uh, damaged uniform fees or uh, money for damaged music. Like that would be something that would go back into their account. Okay. And that's going to vocal music, for instance, and most of that came from, my understanding, from the old magical days. Mm -hmm. Where yes. they would make money from the magical. Uh, so all of those funds are actually going to go into a queue account because they need to purchase the robes and things like that. So that's one of them that would not go into CIS, but would go into a few account. They would have been. I'd like to hear oh, I'm sorry. So we have CIS and we have CSI. We do. So explain the difference. CSI is the um, program that repair, repairs the Chromebooks, it's the class. And so those are the fees that were generated from the repair of those Chromebooks. So students are charged a deductible, either a $25, $50, or $75 deductible if it's not a, a manufacturing issue. And so those revenues went back into the CSI account. Those really need to go back into the Tech Fund 20 account because the tech department purchases all of um, the equipment, all of the supplies for the repair of the Chromebooks. So whatever revenue is generated from the repair of those Chromebooks really needs to go back to the tech supply line item to refund those. We spend about $40,000 a year on equipment, um, like motherboards, new screens, things of that nature. Is this gonna slow down, slow down purchases for, or eliminate the possibility of purchases for some of the programs? A lot of these accounts are are dormant. Um, like for instance, uh, one that uh, Mr. Matthews and I were talking about the other day, the GHS Varsity G Club. Um, nobody can quite even remember when Varsity G was a club in recent years. I know I've heard stories, you know, back in the day where they would actually do activities and go skiing and <laughs> Long time. but that hasn't been something that has actually been used for a number of years so um all of these yes have the dormer have had activity for some well, time. but i do see some of them that certainly have activities so so correct like for example you know like the ghs music oh i'm glad you brought that up okay so we are making a significant change with the fall play the musical and the junior high play as well right so we wanted to make sure that our students could go to any theater production uh, without being charged. They were right, being charged twelve dollars for our registration. We want correct. We want people to participate. Correct, and we want to support theater. So right. um, I met with Mr. Rasso, who is uh, the director for the Spring Musical. He's also acting as a mentor, kind of producer role for some of our younger uh, directors in the district. 
And moving forward, um, all of our students will be able to attend for free. We're going to reduce those prices, so it would cost you the same to go to a musical as it would to go to a basketball game. There'll be senior pricing. Um, and the district will put all of their current funds into a Q account. And then once that money is exhausted over the years, mm -hmm. then the district will refund and replenish that Q account. So, so, so they don't have to worry about they not having enough money to do performance. Or... And the directors will sit down with me. In fact, we have a meeting in April. So the three directors for the uh, fall high school play, the junior high play, and then the musical are going to present budgets. We're going to talk about the budgets, look at that. Um, the majority of the costs are actually with the licensing of the plays and the musicals. Um, and we're going to set our budget for next year. And then we'll be moving forward with, with this plan. So I'm really excited because our students will get to go to our plays and, and musicals for free. And a brand new performing arts center. Absolutely. So, yeah. And this was an initiative of Number Lions. So mm -hmm. I appreciate him wanting to really promote our, our arts. And we want every one of our 621 seats filled at each of those performances. Is that the number, Brian? Yes. <laughs> 623. Oh, 623. Oh, well, that's a seat for Dr. Aspen and I. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, now I'll move on to I need a motion to approve the disposal of GABC. Second. Second. Okay. Is there anything to discuss about this? I have a question. Is, is this is this equipment uh, broke? Uh, update. What are we doing, and why do we have to have a disposal agreement? Well, because that money goes. That equipment was purchased with tax dollars way back in the day. Sorry. So we replaced uh, the tire balancer, tire changer. It was one of the oldest pieces of equipment we brought over to the new center. I have since replaced that. And so we have to do a request for disposal for that equipment. And the second one would be uh, we have a parts washer. We already had another parts washer. We don't have the need to have two of them. And it takes up some wall space that we needed for the new tire machine. And this is because they were purchased with your federal grant funds or yeah. Perkins funds. Yeah. So they're not saleable assets? You know, that's something we probably need to discuss. They might be assets that we could resell, like on marketplace. But I'm going on top of it a little bit about, you know, the precautions that we need to take in order to sell that. That is a working piece of equipment that we want to make sure the liability is taken care of before we go that far. But we also need to get written permission because it is, you can't, once something is purchased, then you can't profit above and beyond the purchase price in essence. So you have to get special permissions with federal grants if you're going to then resell it. Um, so we just need to make sure that through Illinois State Board of Education that we get those approvals if we're going to sell them. We can donate them, we can dispose of them, we can recycle them, but when you're reselling it then it's, if you don't have yeah, permission, it can be construed as double dipping. Allison? Aye. 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 We're getting close to the end. Laura, do you need a break? Okay. Okay. Need a motion to consider personnel. Motion to consider approval of resolution reference to dismissal of professional educator licensed employee PEL Lauren Tuchet. From familiar with this, anybody have any questions? Allison? Aye. 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 Another motion to consider approval of resolution reference to dismissal of professional educator, licensed employee, PEL, Peter Tuchet. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? Allison? Sherby? Aye. West Ham? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Ryan? Yes. Butts? Aye. Rodriguez? Aye. Okay. Need a motion to consider approval of unpaid suspension for Deborah Greenleaf. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, 
Any uh, questions or comments? Allison? Aye. 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 A
um, because that's your that's your last opportunity. And so to know that they're sophomores, and I'm just excited to see what they're gonna do. And to Chloe, I have to say something because it's like I feel like this is our last time together. Um, those records that Chloe broke stood for 25 years, and bowling is not, you know, a renowned sport. Um, but for those of us who participate in it, it is something. It is something to be in an alley, uh, and those tournaments, you're bowling hours, you're there for eight hours and you're bowling. Um, you notice a difference in the, your arm muscle from your throwing arm to your non-throwing <laughs> arm. It looks kind of freaky during the season, but um, I've been at that state tournament. I don't know if it's still held a cherry up in Rockford, yep. Um, that, the, the tension that you have from that first day to that second day, um, I think I, I placed around 26th my year. N um, Nicole Holland, I think, was the 11th place um, that Chloe beat. But um, I had some very special times when I was a bowler. Um, I still have my pin. I got a, a bowling pin and everybody signed it. I don't know if they still do that, Chloe, but if they don't, don't know. okay. Um, so congratulations. I didn't bowl division, but I did bowl a couple years in college myself, and I'll have some more exciting times there, so congratulations. Um, and then I also just want to acknowledge one thing in the personnel agenda. Coach Kisa Henry has decided to hang her hat up. And she has coached the dance team for 16 years. And she has done a tremendous job with the cadets. And she went out with a lot, you know, she didn't go out with a lot of pomp and circumstance because my sister isn't that way. Um, but I wish the next coach, whoever that is, some good luck. And it'll be really, really different watching the cadets perform in the future, knowing that my sister isn't the one out there counting five, six, seven. The comment after that. So um, a couple of things, I'm gonna echo a couple of um, my fellow members. One, I am absolutely super excited to have met um, our state uh, competitors. I, if you follow me, I do share um, the information of our state competitors. So it was nice to finally meet you, Chloe, and um, Gage, and um, the other fine gentlemen over here. And it was great, it was quite a few, and there was a few that I didn't even know them personally but definitely share the information so it was really exciting for me to meet you guys um, outside of that um, I definitely also appreciated the feedback the concern of start times end times and you know again you know addressing those things in last meeting also you know what that looks like for athletes classes you know all things that we definitely take into consideration you know I'm not just a board member I also have two students that will be in this district two different buildings as well so you know all those things are important to me as a parent and board member so um, with that being said thank you for everything you do everyone who's working here in the district keep doing what you're doing and have a great night okay. well I'm not gonna have any comments uh, does anybody have any future agenda items? yes um, so we just heard mr. Matthews we ask about restrooms <laughs> since we're on that high school campus and we're not done I would like to have Brian bring giving you more work. Um, look at what it would take to put restrooms in that bat, in that tennis court area while we're while we're on that campus. I mean, now's the time to to do that kind of stuff. I also would like to um, our rep. We just had we just have state wrestlers. What are we going to do with our wrestlers? Um, you know, what, what, are we, what are we doing there for those folks? Um, looking at um, the whole campus of, you know, the Gale situation, you know, what, how can we have a schematic of what, what our end goal is there at, the, at that 712 campus? 
Um, now's the time to now's the time to do that kind of stuff. I feel at least have a vision and a plan for the next year or two of what we're going to do. <clears throat> Thank you. Lord? Well, I'm glad we got the presentation on the solar projects. I'd like to sometime have a continue that, but as but I'd like to have a report on our electric usage and how it's affected what kind of gain we've had through our solar fields that are already in effect. Okay. You can do that, right? Yes. Anything else? Okay. Uh, next, well, we're going to have a special meeting at a time to be determined for the sale of meals. And, but the uh, regular next meeting will be Monday, April 11th at 7 p.m. And with that, we adjourn. Any motion? Second. Second. <laughs>